many in the audience have ever heard of this? Okay, that's pretty good, pretty darn good. Okay, well, I'm, uh, this is going to take about an hour, and I think due to the number of people, uh, could you hold your questions to the end, please? Can you hear me okay like this? Okay, great. Okay, so why did the Japanese send 9,300 paper balloons against North America? One word answer is that it was revenge. The revenge was for the Doodle Raid of April 18, 1942. We just passed the anniversary of that raid. What was it? That's a twin engine army bomber. It was launched from an aircraft carrier. It was a propaganda stunt by the Roosevelt administration. We were losing badly in the Pacific War, so they used any means they could, and basically it was a suicide mission that was lucky. Uh, but it had a bunch of important effects. For our purposes, the big important effect is that the Japanese high command were humiliated by this. The raid did not do that much damage, but the Japanese homeland was sacred, to the Japanese, uh, they felt honor bound to hit the American homeland. What they wanted to do was take Midway Island, uh, which was kind of halfway between Japan and Hawaii, i.e. Midway, uh, as maybe a springboard to attack the US. They were defeated at the Battle of Midway in June of 42. So here is the problem the Japanese had. Their war goal was to take the resources in Southeast Asia. Uh, to do that with safety, they had to neutralize our bases in the Philippines, which meant we would get, they would get into war with the United States. So they had to hit Pearl Harbor. And yes, they did get into a big war with us. Their problem was that once they seized these regions, which they did rapidly, they said, this is our defensive perimeter. We will attack the Americans when they try to strike us and give them so much casualties, they will sue for peace and we will uh, gain all these resources. The problem with this strategy is they had no bases to hit either Hawaii or the mainland United States. These are huge distances. Their first strategy was, we have these super huge submarines. They ha carry float planes. The submarine had to surface. They had to assemble the float plane. They shot it off against the Pacific Northwest and dropped incendiaries. They did not have many fires because of that. And later, the Japanese army told the Navy, we need your boats to reinforce our island garrisons. So you guys can't use that. A bunch of researchers at a Japanese military institution figured out that they could use a novel form of attack, unmanned balloons, that would drop the bombs over, automatically over North America. And they called these the Fugo weapons. I'll tell you in a minute why is that. They initially said, we'll use battleships and submarines again. Those ships had higher priorities. So they had to launch them from the main islands of Japan. That's 6,200 miles. These were called the Fugo weapons. OK, as I've stated in the uh, slide, Fu is the 32nd character of the Japanese syllabulary or alphabet. Go was the equivalent for number. Fugo meant it was number 32 of the Japanese Military Scientific Laboratory. But Fu also happens to be the first syllable of Fusen, their word for balloon. So this was kind of a play on words. You all have seen in the weather forecast the jet stream. That's a strong river of air moving about 120 miles an hour over the Pacific at 30,000 feet. That's where an airliner flies. And oftentimes, the airliner's going from 
west to east, get a boost. When my brother returned from Vietnam, his flight was an hour and a half early because they had a 120 mile tailwind. Okay, so we see the jet stream there. They said, let's use this to give our balloons a nice highway of air. Okay, they would launch the balloons from the home island and they need to keep it at above 30,000 feet. Here's our physics lesson. During the daytime, a balloon's envelope or bag, if it's filled with gas or smoke or air, it's going to expand because the sun is heating it. So the balloon is going to rise. At nighttime, on the other hand, okay, if nothing happens, the, the balloon will fall. So the main trick is keeping it at that altitude. Here's what they came up with. This balloon is about 30 feet across. as the size of a present hot air balloon. But it does not have hot air in it. It's enclosed. If you take a look at a hot air balloon, there's a little propane heater at the bottom, and they periodically fire it up. But here, it is enclosed. It has hydrogen gas in it. Um, you have these uh, rope shroud lines going down to the payload. The Canadians used a nice elegant term for it called chandelier. It, it carried uh, the devices for altitude and sandbags and weaponry. Um, on the side of the balloon is a self-destruct bomb. And, um, and here's a little fuse going up for that. Oh yeah, the military payload had about 70 pounds. That's of the weapons they could carry. This is at the bottom of the envelope. It's flipped upside down. This is a gas release valve. This is for the daylight. When the balloon heats and reaches a certain pressure, this valve opens up and releases the gas. So in the uh, daytime, you're not going to have the balloon get hotter and hotter and pop. The nighttime dropping the sandbags, that's the hard and elaborate part. Um, the key to the whole device is right here. This is a clear plastic box. It was early plastic called Bakelite. Who remembers Bakelite radios and other things? Raise your hand, people. All right, okay. I mean, they're worth money now. Uh, they, they handle with care because they're pretty uh, fragile. It oxidizes. Okay. Top you have the battery. It's in a clear box and it's filled with salt water to act as an antifreeze. Because remember, you're up at 30,000 feet, it gets cold. Then you have a number of barometers. The most important barometer tells you how high the balloon is going. When it goes ab uh, below 30,000 feet, it sets a couple switches that goes to this ring around here. And at the end of the ring in these holes, are what they call blowout plugs. They're essentially shotgun shells. So the balloon barometer reaches were under 30,000 feet. It flicks a couple switches and a bomb right here and then a bomb at the other side or a sandbag at the other side releases, keeping the balloon level and hopefully the balloon will rise up. I'm going to test you about this at the end. Uh, and if it doesn't get to the right altitude, then they'll shoot out some more sandbags, and eventually the balloon should rise back to the cruising altitude. Now, when all the sandbags are dropped, then they drop the weapons on the balloons, which is down here. Here we have, it's about a 25-pound high explosive bomb. And then you have this cylinder here. That's about a seven and a half pound incendiary bomb, which starts fires. The normal load was two incendiaries and one high explosive. These guys are naval aviators. How can I tell that? Anybody, any World War II uniform buffs? The naval aviators back in World War II wore green, gray uniforms to show that they were better than the rest of the Navy. Because uh, they flew, unlike the submariners who looked like regular sailors, they, they, they knew they were good. Uh, right, right, uh, right, mate? Okay. We have a, a Navy submariner here. 
or submariner or submariner? I always said submariner. Submariner, okay. Okay, here is another shot of the bottom of the balloon. Uh, again, you have the high explosive bomb and the incendiary. Um, and these were uh, pretty nasty things. I'll get into what they did later. Okay, here is a captured balloon. It's in a high altitude chainer, chamber at a research institute. And they got the um, altitude in the chamber up to uh, below 30,000. And uh, they just dropped some sandbags. And, you know, it's like a shotgun shell. There's a lot of uh, powder in it. The Japanese sent these starting in November of 1944. And throughout the winter of 44-45, we kept finding balloons that had high explosive and incendiaries. The Japanese wanted to strike at the American mainland to avenge the Doolittle Raid, and they hoped the incendiary bombs would set forest fires. Now, if you're thinking uh, they're sending incendiary-equipped balloons in the wintertime to start forest fires. <laughs> that didn't make sense to us. So what, and again, this happens in every war, is you're never going to have all the information, and you have to deduce on what's the worst case that your enemy can do. They knew, the Americans and Canadians knew that the Japanese had active research programs in chemical and biological weapons. Oops. And there the, are people were correct. The researchers wanted to use chemical and biological weapons. Uh, but we never had any confirmation of that because between the Japanese surrender in, in August of 45 and when MacArthur took over in August and September of 45, a lot of materials that the Japanese held, they destroyed. But in uh, 95, uh, this New York Times uh, reporter, Nicholas Kristof, he now writes columns for the New York Times, he discovered that old wartime documents were being found in Japanese flea markets. Because like, you know, dad might have been a colonel, bought these home, kept them in the attic. He died, the family got rid of them. And so the Japanese didn't destroy everything, apparently. And these documents show that, yes, the Japanese researchers wanted to use chemical and biological weapons. But it went up to the high command, Tojo, General Tojo, who was the head of the Japanese government. He got kicked out, but he still was head of the Japanese army. He said, we will not use chemical weapons because then the Americans can use it against us. And what are we doing? We are defending. We can't run and hide. They would be sitting ducks for our chemical weapons. So Tojo said, no, you have to use conventional munitions. Frankly, in my book, the Japanese were using chemical weapons against the Chinese. I think we should have had every right to use them against them, but we didn't. Okay, these balloons were made out of paper. The Japanese did not want to use any strategic materials, and so they decided they would use paper, if you can believe it or not. Uh, they had centuries of experience in making papers. They found a new method that used non-strategic materials, even for paper making, and they came up with a special laminated uh, mulberry papered. When they're shellacked with a persimmon juice sealant, they were waterproof. Now, why was having lamination important? Okay, when you have one piece of paper, it's easy to tear. When you have several pieces of paper, it's harder to tear. Okay, so they glued these together, they put this sealant on it, and it repelled water and was very strong. You've seen those little uh, umbrellas and drinks, and sometimes you can get a full paper Japanese umbrella. They do a pretty good job of repelling water. Um, so here's uh, women doing paper making, and these were done in small 
uh, cottage industries all around Japan. And they came up with enough paper for 10,000 balloons. And the people didn't know why they were making all this paper. Okay, to glue the paper together, they used high school girls. All Japanese students, no matter how old, had to do compulsory war work. And as we all know, female fingers are much nimbler than guy fingers, right? That's what the Japanese thought at any rate. So these girls had to be in rooms that were totally sealed. They couldn't have a gust of wind coming in. Um, notice they're wearing sweatbands on that. The paste was edible. It was made out of Arab root, which some of you people who are cooks or bakers know that you can use that in cooking. They were on such tight rations that the girls pilfered out the paste and took them back to their families. And if they were caught, they got punished pretty severely. Okay. As I said, they had enough to make 10,000 paper uh, balloons, which they did. They inflated them in like movie houses and sumo wrestling arenas. Uh, they shellacked them with the sealant. Uh, they made 10,000 of them. And they tried like the Dickens to make sure there was no trace that the Japanese, it came from Japan. Nothing they wanted to do that, but we'll see. They weren't as clever as they thought. And they didn't tell the workers what they were doing. And the workers speculated, but n very few thought they were going to be unmanned paper balloons. OK. Japanese had to do a lot of testing. This is one of their test balloons. This chap in the dark uniform, he's a naval officer. Like most militaries, the Army and the Navy competes. The Army won, and they folded the Navy effort into it. The, main, the reason the Army won was that the Navy balloons was technically superior, but they used rubber, which was in short supply. And notice the trouble in a wind that you can get. Here we have a drawing of a launching site for balloons. This is on the main island of Honshu on its east coast. Uh, these big tanks are hydrogen. They fill smaller tanks that they take over to a launch balloon. The balloon is tethered on a mount, and it is staked down, as you can see, uh, and the arms are there, and they slowly fill the balloon up. They don't fill it up all the way because they know that the gas is going to expand. And in this one, they are slowly releasing it. They take the stakes up. Notice there's the self-destruction bomb right up there. The early balloon launches were dangerous because they hadn't figured out that static electricity would set off the explosives. And OK, what's the gas in here? Hydrogen. OK, remember the pictures of the Hindenburg? That was hydrogen. So, you know, if this thing worked as advertising, it would drop the bombs from 30,000 feet. You've seen airliners up at 30,000 feet, even with the contrails, they're kind of hard to see sometimes. Uh, they would drop the bombs, and the explosion would come, and people would go, where'd that come from? And then a little later, there would be a self-destruct device on the chandelier, and it would explode on that, and then a little later, the fuse for this self-destruct bomb would blow, and you'd see maybe a lightning bolt or something. You wouldn't think it was a balloon. So if it worked as advertised, nobody could figure out what it was. Well, most of them didn't work as advertised, as we'll see in a minute. The crews thought that the launches were strangely beautiful. Uh, they couldn't launch them every day. They had to do it when there was little wind and uh, calm, you know, basically calm, and that usually took place after a weather system passed. So it was in the morning, early morning, or in the evening at sunset. So the balloons would rise up that looked like big jellyfish, and they would be colored by sunsets and sunrises, purples, reds, yellows. Um, kind of nice if you were in the special balloon regiment. 
As I said, we don't have a lot of photographs from the Japanese or much documentation because they destroyed a lot. Okay. The Special Balloon Regiment launched over 9,300 Fugo balloons in the five months from November 44 to April 45. The Japanese hoped that 1,000 out of those 9,300 would reach mainland North America. That's a 9% success rate. So they thought even if we made all these balloons and only 10% got there, that would be enough if we could hit the American homeland and avenge the Doolittle raid. Now, if they could get one forest fire that could replicate the damage of a 1932 Oregon forest fire, they think, thought that would be really great. And the Japanese assumed that American news organizations would not ignore such an important story. And so we, they would get feedback not immediately, but maybe through neutral countries. And they thought that Americans were an undisciplined and gossipy people. They were just 70 years before Facebook, okay? Uh, the, the newspapers and the broadcasts would provide coverage to the weapon and the Japanese might tweak their attack plan, but they got little news. In November, in December of 44, they were couple articles about two balloons that landed in uh, Montana and Wyoming, but nothing after that. So by mid-April 45, the Japanese high command concluded that their campaign had failed. Um, also, American B-29 bomber range were destroying their hydrogen facilities. So they abandoned the attack. Okay. Kind of looks like a jellyfish, doesn't it? Okay. Oops. Here is their Achilles heel. Remember that battery box? It was filled with salt water. The battery box was key because that provided the electricity to drop the sandbags and the bombs. Well, the salt water wasn't strong enough. Most of the balloons froze up and landed in the Pacific because they couldn't regulate the dropping of the sandbags. So here is one of the balloons in the Pacific Ocean. And this is actually one of the last ones that were launched. Um, I'm not sure what kind of aircraft took that picture. I think I got that from the Canadian archives. OK, so instead of 1,000 balloons landing in North America, only 300 were discovered before the end of the war. Uh, there's been a few since then. But in my guess, there's probably more out there that are waiting to be discovered. Here is their distribution. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically from the Aleutians through Alaska into Canada, into the US, and a couple in Michigan, and even a few in Mexico. Here's the Mexican recovery of a balloon. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think you can see much detail of it. Uh, there is the um, ring for the venting. And then here we have some uh, in Upper Canada. I can't remember. Is, I think White Horse is in the Northwest Territories, but that's pretty north. And it got caught on a pine tree. And then here is the balloon that landed in North Door. And I got this photo from the FBI. I think this chap is wearing a badge. I think that's a map of Grand Rapids. But I've given this talk. The photo's been published in some newspapers. Nobody has identified this guy. I think he's a lawman of some kind. Uh, OK, well, I'll talk more about the North Door balloon in detail. OK, now we're in North America. The Japanese are launching balloons. How are we going to counter it? OK, for overall North American defense, nice divisional labor. Canadians research and take care of their balloons. We take care of ours. Canadians just had, a, I think, 10 engineering officers that had the whole Western Canada to do that. That was all the resources they sunk in that. In the US, the Navy had responsibility for any balloons over water the Army over land, 
And then the FBI got involved. Why is that? Who remembers J. Edgar Hoover? Okay, J. Edgar Hoover was into Empire Building. And he thought balloons normally carry people. What if they're carrying spies? So they said, we will be involved with you, the Army. We're buddies. Okay, one of their big countermeasures, and this was the Army, was let's use radar to, to detect the balloons. A lot of problem with that. There's not a whole lot of uh, metal in a balloon. Um, they did a number of special radar sites on the Olympic Peninsula in uh, Washington State. Problem with that is we set them up after the Japanese quit launching them, but we didn't know that. So again, you're operating on the capabilities of the enemy. They put it up. Uh, once read an article about this, the guy said it was the most boring duty he ever had. And actually, I've talked to a few of the people. They said it was you know, really boring until we had to go out and look for them, and then it got darn uncomfortable. Okay, one countermeasure is interception. Both the Canadians and the Americans did have fighter pilots sit at the end of runways hoping they would be scrambled to attack a balloon. I talked to an MSU prof about 30 years ago. He was one of the pilots in training. He said he could have been preparing for the invasion of Japan and said he had to set in a, I think it was a Hellcat, F6F, and uh, nothing ever came. He never got scrambled. Though some P-38s did get scrambled over the Aleutians, and there's some gun camera film, which I didn't have. I chose this. Uh, Illustration, because it's in color. This is a Canadian, not a Royal Air Force. The Canadians didn't use the maple leaf on their planes until after the war. This is a very old P-40 Warhawk. That's what the Flying Tigers flew. It's right at the Canadian or the British Columbia Washington border. Uh, and this was a fighter pilot from Europe. He was, um, I don't know, he got scrambled. And he shot it down, but it landed in Washington, so it was the, um, Washington, the Americans' responsibilities. And this was pretty early on, February, and it was pure luck that he found it. The neatest interception was this one in British Columbia in March. It was done by a Canso patrol bomber. We know it as a Catalina, a PBY. Uh, had a patrol radius of about 1,800 miles in 1940 airplane seats, and it didn't go much over 200 miles, so this was uh, not the most comfortable plane, but they were flying along near their base, Coal Harbor, and they see a balloon around twilight, and that is a flare that uh, they picked up on the photograph. The balloon is landing in a forest, right close within eyesight of the base, but it took them a couple days to get it because they had a snowstorm that night, and uh, they, they just waited till conditions got better. But the uh, PBY kept flying over it and using its uh, drag, the Air Russian passed it to kind of uh, herd the balloon to shore. So I consider that the spiffiest interception, but I think it's better than shooting it down. Now, our biggest countermeasure for the balloon was investigation. These things would literally come out of nowhere. This is one of the earliest balloons. Uh, the National Archives said this came from Newcastle, Wyoming. The official tally said Thermopolis, Wyoming. In the files at the National Archives, the uh, FBI and the, no, it was the Army, <laughs> they even had a, a Wyoming highway map to get this place. This was in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they recovered it, and I don't know if you can see it, there's like five airmen in some kind of a gym, and this does not look like paper to me. Um, the original photo was not. But this gym was decked out for a party. And I just, I would, and then there's some initials on that ball there, but I could never figure out what party it was in. But, uh, okay. Here is one in Nevada. Guess who the FBI guy is? Then the coat and tie and the nice spiffy hat. And then uh, who knows who these guys are. And this is one that landed Glacier National Park. Now, they found it in July of 45. And in the official records, 
The Park Service employees said they found it. But in the oral histories of the conscientious objectors that were doing forest fire duty and trail building in Glacier Park, they said they found it and they told the uh, Park Service people. So if you're a conscientious objector in World War II, you had to do something for the government. And these guys were in a national park. All right, here's my f second favorite, com favorite Canadian one. Uh, this is in Oxford House, Manitoba, which is kind of above Montana. And you've seen the series Ice Road Truckers. Before they got highways, they had tractor train. The tractor pulled a bunch of carts, and they usually did it in the summertime when the lakes froze. And it just so happens their route went on a lake that a balloon had crashed at. I mean, pure luck, and the, the balloon part of it had blown, and so here's the shroud at the shore. But if it had landed at another lake, nobody would have found it. The biggest threat outside of um, gas warfare, chemical warfare, biological warfare, was forest fires. And here are the two incendiaries. And the balloon that got me started on this was when I was working at Colorado State University. I found out that one landed just outside of uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, incendiary landed on a farm. A uh, farmer and his son went out and saw it. It's in a field. And there's a hole being burnt by the incendiary. But then other little incendiaries are coming out of it and starting fires. Of course, this is on a... Um, Farm field, it didn't do much damage as in uh, March, but it was, it was pretty impressive. This is what the incendiary looks like before it was dropped, and here's after it's been ignited and starts. And you can't see this one, but this is a yardstick. Uh, this is in the Canadian uh, Explosive Ordnance School. Um, the logo on the yardstick is in French, uh, because even then they were bilingual. Uh, okay. Okay, the threat was considered real because these balloons had incendiaries. Most of the western U.S. and Canada was forested. We thought the fire danger during the winter times not existed, but from April to September, surprise, surprise, that's the most dangerous period. Um, and they thought the prevailing summer winds might bring more balloons to Canada. And then the Japanese had developed a phosphorus tree, a cardboard square they thought was uh, pretty dangerous. Also, when they did forestry in World War II, they dropped a lot of peacetime work, which was cleaning up after they got the valuable timber. So there was what they called slash, roots and limbs that weren't commercially viable. So they, they were really waiting for a forest fire. They, and of course, the guys who did the forest firefighting, most of those guys were in the military by that time. So the Canadians basically, the provinces had control of the forests. The national government said, you guys are on your own. We don't have any slack in our economy. The Americans were a little better. Uh, right before the war, the concept of parachuting firefighters down was in. They had developed special parachutes to loft the uh, fighter. Uh, a military parachutist, he's being shot at. He wants to go down really quick, and our chutes are designed that way. For a forest fire fighter, you want to be sure to avoid the actual fire. You want to get close to it, but not too close. So you did special kind of chutes. All right, the Army had a battalion, about three to 400, of black paratroopers. And even though the paratroopers in Europe and Japan took hideous casualties, the army did not send them as replacements. Instead, they sent them out west to fight fires. They had cargo planes and spotter planes. It was um, called the Firefly Project. Um, and so these guys were uh, left out of the fighting, but they did pull some duty. And the actual damage was zip. Because um, they stopped launching them in April of 45. Again, we didn't know that they had done that. They didn't broadcast it. 
As I said earlier, the Japanese were ordered by their high command not to use biological weapons. But our researchers are saying it does not make sense to send all these incendiaries out in the wintertime. Biological warfare has to be considered. And also, the salt water that was in the box, that contained an ingredient called purple gentian, which was often used with uh, biological experiments. So they thought maybe these boxes contain biological agents. And this is what they thought was the most uh, likely things that could infect humans. I'm not going to read them all. They all plague chemical agents. And then also animals. And frankly, both people don't forget about this. In, the, in World War II, the young docs, meaning up to age 50, they went in the military. The same with the veterinarians. So if we did have biological warfare, that was going to be doing damage to human and animal health, we would have been in a bind. Uh, unlike the firefighters who were told that you guys are going to be looking at Japanese balloons, the public health people and the animal health people, only the top guys were told that. Every, the people doing the real work on the ground in the states, they were say, be on the lookout for strange outbreaks of diseases, but they did not tell people why. There's a big cone of silence. We stationed in the U.S. Uh, about 12 teams composed of about eight or nine chemical warfare soldiers uh, to do decontamination work if a Japanese balloon was found and it had chemical or biological agents. Uh, these people were not told why they were doing all this drilling for an attack. Um, and how would you like to carry all this nice chemical warfare gear out to a site that was pretty much inaccessible and then put on your chemical warfare impregnated uh, uniforms which didn't breathe and use bleach to decontaminate these uh, sites. Now the Canadians initially said we need a medical officer with the uh, initial investigatory teams. And most of the officers they had in Western Canada were out of shape and pr pretty old and did nothing but complain. Uh, and so after a while, when they weren't finding any biological uh, weapons, the Canadian Army said, OK, you guys don't have to do this anymore. And everybody was pleased. Because the chemical warfare guys were just thinking, can these guys shut up? Uh, another interesting thing, uh, up in Alaska, no, this was in the Yukon, Canadian territory. Uh, some Indians, well, in, in Canada they now call them First Nations, but back then they were Indians. Um, they, a family was poisoned. And uh, we had built a highway for our airplanes to deliver weapons uh, to Ru the Soviet Union, the Russians. And so when the Ameri an American air base got word that this family was sick, it was in the middle of nowhere, an army doctor who had never parachuted before, he parachuted down, check these people out. He said it was due to food poisoning from rancid food left by an American construction crew for the Alaska Highway. And the American newspapers said, isn't this great? We'll help our buddies, the Canadians out. The Canadians were chagrined because they didn't want the rest of the world to know what primitive conditions their Indians were living in. Um, and there's a whole other story with that. but. Uh, I won't go into it now. Uh, OK, there's no de uh, evidence that there was any biological weapons on the balloons, even though the Japanese researchers initially wanted to use it. Our most effective countermeasure was censorship. Remember earlier I said the Japanese did not hear anything except for two incidents, and they shut down their program in April. We, that was a conscious policy by the Canadian and the American authorities. Uh, imposed in January 45, aggressively enforced. A lot of newspaper and broadcast people knew about this, but they were told, don't do anything, and they pestered the authorities a lot of times. 
and it even reached the comic strip in August of 45. Who remembers, I think this is Smiling Jack. And it was also in a Tim Tyler's Luck cartoon. You know, if you read the official histories, they say censorship was voluntary. And the news media even today says, yeah, we kept secrets. Even we kept secrets about this. OK, what could the government do to newspapers? They controlled newsprint. You violate censorship ru rules, you are not going to print a newspaper. If you were a broadcaster, the, governor, the government will yank away your license and your broadcasting thing. So even though it was voluntary censorship, the government could back it up really quick. Um, on May 5th, 45, there were finally casualties. And it was a church picnic up in Oregon. Um, a pastor uh, drove up with the kids and his wife. Uh, they parked in an area where there was a Forest Service crew doing some work. Uh, the pastor went to talk to the Forest Service guys, the kids, and um, the pastor's wife went to the other side. One of the kids yelled out, hey, what's this? The Forest Service guys knew about the Japanese balloons, but before they could get there, somebody tugged something and a high explosive bomb exploded killing the five kids and the preacher's wife. Um, the local people were really mad about this, and rightly so. And then to add insult to injury, the authorities said, well, we're going to use our notification on a selective basis, and we are going to do the targeted population. And since kids were killed in this, special uh, memos were read to kids in schools and scout troops saying if you see something strange in the woods don't touch them. Now what do you think happened when the kids went home and told their parents about this? Parents had not been told and so from really May until June there was a constant barrage of pressure from the news media and the people in that area about it and so the government had a very brief um, announcement that the Japanese were launching balloons. They gave very little detail. And so what do you think happened after the announcement that the Japanese were sending balloons over? People saw Japanese balloons everywhere. Uh, a freighter in the Sioux locks saw a Japanese balloon. Now remember the Japanese quit sending these in April. This is June, July. It was the planet Venus that the crew on the ship. And I was told at one meeting I gave this talk at is that a small town in Nebraska, somebody uh, said he had shot at night at one of the Japanese balloons. Morning came, and they found out that the town's water tower was riddled with buckshot. <laughs> so oftentimes, you see what you want to see. Um, and actually, some of the biggest breaches happened not by the press, but by the government itself. In this one, in May of 45, uh, a censor in Toronto cleared this story. And it's talking about biological warfare. And it was only in one edition, and then it was taken out. But even the head of the Forest Service in a national uh, broadcast on NBC gave out classified information. So, you know, censorship happens, but also leaks happen sometimes inadvertently, as we can see today, but I won't dwell on that. Okay, it was the most effective countermeasure because the Japanese stopped their attack due to lack of feedback. There's all kind of irony in this story, and the biggest one was an incident that took place in March of 45 at the Hanford Nuclear Area in, has anybody been to Eastern Washington? It is not. Yeah, tell us what Eastern Washington's like, sir. Nothing. Nothing. It's high plains, no trees, no rain. You know, equally distant from nowhere. 
okay, which is a gr oops, which is a great place to build a nuclear facility to build the plutonium for the A bombs. One of the balloons hit the power line for uh, the Bonneville Power Administration that fed electricity to the Hanford plant. The electricity was shut off, and here we have these nuclear reactors working on making plutonium. Fortunately, the backup generator kicked on, and so they almost shut down the A-bomb program. And this is the hardest one to get the information about. Uh, for the longest time, they didn't release anything, and then they released everything with no indexes. So, you know, it's trying to find a needle in a haystack. And even in the oral histories, they just say, yeah, balloon came, shut down. Our power backup went on, no problem. Okay, summing up, here are the number, the breakdown of balloons. Uh, the bulk was in the U.S., and most of these were in the western states. As you can see, um, here are our balloons. Uh, and we got two in Michigan. Yeah, the one in Kansas landed in what's now a reservoir. Okay, here's the Great Lakes State. Where do the balloons land? North Door and Farmington. Okay, for North Door, right on the Allegan-Kent line, county lines, line, we are on the County Line Road. Here's Adams Street near the intersection with 100. And uh, the boys were doing what boys do after screw school, <laughs> just goofing around. And they see a strange object in the sky coming towards them. Correct me if I'm wrong, Buzz. Uh, and it lands very close to you, right? Half a mile. They go out into the field. Was it snowing back then? Yeah. Okay. So they found the balloon. What'd you do next, Buzz? Yeah. Okay. Buzz, you and your buddies, you uh, saw a lot of rope on it. And um, I don't know if you can see it, but some of the ends of the rope have burnt and cut. And back then, Ordinary things like rope was in short supply because of rationing during the war. Uh, Buzz and his buddies enlisted an older guy who had a pickup truck, and they took it to the Fine family farmhouse. Okay, Mrs. Fine, who is now deceased, as I understand, correct? She was being visited by her, um, oh wait, here comes Buzz. No, no, correct, correct me if I'm saying anything wrong, Buzz. I interviewed the Fines about 30 years ago when I came to Michigan. Okay, Mrs. Fine was being visited by a parish priest, correct? Father Walters. Father Wallers? Walters. Walters. And they, they're excited. They've got this big, they don't know what it is, right? Looks like a balloon maybe. And they're thinking, boy, look at all the rope on this. We're going to have fun with it, right? Okay, what does the father tell Mrs. Fine? I don't know. Well, ac <laughs> according to the FBI, the father says, this is probably a weather balloon and we should report it. So you guys, thanks to the priest doing the right thing, didn't get a good, good piece of uh, equipment to play with. Can I have a mic when you Sure, sure we can. Um, you want it now or you want me to? Okay, whenever I'm done. Okay, so they take it down to the basement, store it. Weather Bureau tells the authorities um, it's not one of ours. Because Weather Bureau every day sends up balloons, check the weather. Uh, but who is contacted is the Army and the FBI. And um, so here is the picture again of the officer. Uh, they took it from the Fine House and sent it to uh, the Naval Technical Air Center in Anacostia, District of Columbia. Uh, and the Fines are told, don't tell anything about this. 
Um, and the FBI agent was bombarded with by the Bush Telegraph by the reporters. The reporters had somehow found out about it, and they were bugging the FBI agent in Battle Creek uh, about any kind of information, and he had to, uh, you know, uh, keep a safe lock with all his papers and information about it. So, okay, Buzz, it's all yours. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks, uh, Brett. Started this whole ball rolling. I don't know where he got the information, but uh, he called me uh, three, four months ago and wanted to talk about the balloon, and so we did. Anyway, uh, everybody that uh, was involved in the balloon uh, brings back a lot of memories, especially uh, Ken Fine and Bob Fine. And uh, we were so excited, we tracked it and got Joe Wolf to come with his pickup and we bundled it up and dragged it on a snowy road and brought it back and put it in the basement of the Fine Farm. And, uh, Nobody knew, uh, we called everybody and nobody knew the sheriffs come out and uh, nobody knew where it was but uh, somebody knew what it was because the next morning I wasn't at the neighbor at the fine farm then but it disappeared and for years you couldn't find out where it went or what it was or nothing. It was all classified stuff. Anyway, uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Pat Fine. Uh, Ken's wife for allowing us to go out there and uh, take pictures at the farm and uh, show uh, Brent and WZZM where, where we first seen it and where it came down and uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Mary Jane uh, Leonard uh, who's a fine girl and Pat Fine who is a McAway girl for uh, coming up with the pictures, and Sandy, coming up with the pictures of uh, Bob and Ken. Uh, I was nine and a half, Ken was ten and a half, and Bob was about eleven and a half. So I'm glad that the uh, bomb on the balloon had exploded in the air, because uh, we'd have went after it anyway, and we'd have probably had a short term. <laughs> <laughs> so it happened on the 23rd of uh, February of 1945, and uh, the picture of that balloon coming down real slow on an angle across the fine farm is uh, just like it was yesterday. I could still see it. Uh, we were so excited, and uh, it was just quite an experience. And so I want to thank everybody that was involved in this thing and uh, for showing up, and I want to thank you for bringing all the information. And, and uh, I'd like to thank Brent from WZZM. He's the guy that started this whole ball of rolling. So, in a way, it was something to behold, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. all, all you people were in the neighborhood, so okay. it just happened. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Bill. Now, back in the mid-'80s when I uh, interviewed the Fine family, uh, I did leave copies of the documents I got from the National Archives. And I think I gave documents to Teresa, didn't I? Okay, so the, you know, the government documents, um, the detail, the amount of uh, the information about it, where it's in local hands, in a couple local hands, and I assumed uh, motivated researchers like these young scholars in front of me might want to do a history project someday. Okay, talking about, you know, Buzz was talking about they were lucky. They didn't get killed by the bombs. And this, this bomb worked as advertised. Um, there wasn't a payload on it. The, the rope was burned and frayed. So who knows where the bombs dropped at, but the uh, self-destruct bomb on the gas bag didn't explode. Uh, now, there were a couple of twins in Minton, Saskatchewan in February 5 that were darn lucky. The first balloon that landed in Canada landed close to the Saskatchewan U.S. border. It was blown a couple miles and was dropping things as it did. It had the payload on it. These twins were farm boys. They found the demolition block. 
they took it to the workshop and the farm and had a welding tool and put it in. And this was picric acid. These guys could have been killed, but they weren't. They were, you know, they would have been the first casualties in February of 45. And it would have been a harder time keeping the news down about that. Okay, we're not yet done with North Door's balloon, though. No, those, there was the ropes and hooks. Now, after the balloon was tested in Anacostia, D.C., that's a part of Washington, D.C., it was sent to the Naval Air Station of Lakehurst, New Jersey. Does Lakehurst, New Jersey mean anything to anybody? You guys, what? what? what you, yeah, the Hindenburg blew up there. But that was the Navy's base for lighter than air activities. There was a chap there, a 19-year-old uh, seaman apprentice named Don Picard, who, whose family were balloonists. In fact, they worked in general in uh, Minneapolis with General Mills to develop plastic balloon gas bags or envelopes. So he, he comes from balloonist stock. He said, can I have this balloon? And, he, and, the, and the Navy says, sure. He goes back home to Minneapolis. He is in Army ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps. He wants to be an officer. He wants to get a military balloonist badge. He sets it up so he makes the balloon from north door flyable again. He doesn't use hydrogen. I think he uses helium. And uh, as you can see, he successfully flew over Minneapolis on that. And when Brent was doing his research, he, he did an excellent job. He found out that Mr. Picard is still living. And actually, when this uh, article in Air and Space Smithsonian came out, um, yeah, I don't have the uh, issue on that. Uh, it sa he said, uh, Picard was uh, quoted as being the bomb came, from, the balloon came from Flint. And I emailed him, I said, really? And he goes, well, that's what they told me. Well, there were only two balloons in Michigan, and the only one that had an envelope was in North Door. And the envelope is in Mr. Picard's basement, or garage, OK? He put some insect stuff. I called, when I found out about this, I called the uh, Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, talked to their balloon expert. He says, we have three or four of them, of the envelopes or gas bags. They're still in good condition. His should be in good condition. Um, all right, but there's more. We go across the state to Farmington. Um, OK, I think, yeah, here we have Eight Mile Road. This is Farmington. Uh, hmm? Where? Farmington in southeast Michigan? You know, the Detroit area? OK. Right on the border between Wayne and Oakland County? Yeah. OK, the incident happened at this house on, on Gill Road in Farmington, Michigan. And I'm showing the garden because on a Sunday afternoon in February 1945, a, uh, the owner of the house looked out and saw fire burning in the field. And he didn't think much of it. And then when it got warmer in March and April, he um, started gardening. He saw a strange tin can, didn't think much of it. And then in, uh, later on in the spring, when the first very short announcement of the Japanese balloons came out, He's saying, that really didn't look like a tin can. And so uh, this is the um, uh, burnt incendiary. It so happened that this gentleman, this neighbor, was a sergeant in the state police. He gave it to the sergeant. A couple days later, the Army guys came. By this time, the FBI had got tired of uh, balloons. And they said, don't talk about this. This was a Japanese balloon, uh, an incendiary from it. So this balloon worked as advertised. It came over all the way to Michigan, way off course, dropped its incendiary, and then probably drifted into Canada. Nobody's seen it since and probably self-destructed. Now what happened in Michigan, the authorities didn't know about Japanese balloons because none had ever traveled that far. 
except for the one in Byron, none had exploded. So since two had landed in Michigan, they had a special meeting of the FBI, the military, state police, government officials, um, and uh, they had all kind of precautions to take, but the biggest point of debate was if a balloon is shot down, who's gonna take responsibility for the damage? So even then, liability was a big concern. Uh, the Air Force finally said, we'll pay for any damages, and that was the end of the incident. Um, wasn't as exciting as the one in North Door. Okay, oops. Okay, why haven't you heard about it? Well, when the Japanese surrendered, there was a flood of classified material, including balloons, that was released. Also, there were all kind of other news stories that crowded with it, uh, especially, these are Canadian headlines, where's the one I want? Uh, Thoughtless lads of Senate path, blood on victory celebration. In the US and Canada, at the end of the war in Europe, and the end of the war in Japan, there were a lot of celebratory riots. Kind of like MSU after an NC2A basketball championship. Uh, so it just got buried in a lot of, uh, you know, post-war news. But then there was a more censorship being done. There were a few casualties, so people kind of forgot about that. But then we did experiments on high-tech balloons. This is what uh, Don Picard's father was working on with General Mills, big plastic balloons. So there was military research for that. Also, we use these for spy satellites, or not satellite, spy balloons over the Soviet Union. And we had about as much luck getting high quality photographs of Soviet military installations that the Japanese had in causing casualties. Uh, it was a really hit or miss. The uh, Soviets, you know, recovered some. They released drawings. Uh, we also had experiments in anti-crop uh, use of the balloons. Uh, that was never used, uh, but the, the North Koreans said we did do it during the Korean War. Once, now we fast forward several decades, when we kicked the Taliban out of Kabul in Afghanistan in a uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda complex, there was a balloon on a whiteboard with some script saying, let's do, let's use it. Uh, there's no evidence that they did. I once gave this talk to one of the prime research institutes in Canada out in Alberta. And when I was done, I asked the head of the facility, was this just a matter of historical interest or do you think this would be a problem today? And the head of the research institute goes, oh, no, just historical incidents. Later, when I'm talking with, with the real researchers, they're saying this would be a royal pain to investigate if somebody used balloons to drop biological or chemical warfare material. They said it probably wouldn't be that effective, but just the fact that having to work on it and trace these things would be a real pain. Uh, balloons are being used militarily, generally for surveillance. They're tethered though, they're tied to the ground. Okay, this is the end. Uh, the two photographs, the, f uh, the chap holding the chandelier, he is a uh, Canadian uh, royal engineer, bomb disposal expert. Uh, I interviewed him before he died. His, the family trait, what they were pack rats. I had all kind of wonderful photographs from them. This is from a Japanese English book about a, written by a woman who worked on the balloons as a child. And that's the kids lacquering the balloon. So, well, thanks for coming out and I'm, for enduring the sunset. Hey everybody, I'm Kevin Fleischfeld with the Byron Center. Now I'm here to represent the Byron Center. Um, historical Museum and the Historical Society. You know, tonight was a phenomenal night. You know, this is an unbelievable story that have happened here in Byron Center. Everybody's got to agree with that, correct? Yeah. You know, it is incredible. And what we want to do tonight is bring this balloon home. It's in Minneapolis. It belongs in Byron Center at our Historical Society and Museum. And that's where it belongs. And so tonight, if anybody could reach out 
and go to our Facebook. It's under the, bear with me, Byron Center Historical Museum and Historical Society. And it's under, and when you go in there on their Facebook, it's go to our Bring Our Balloon Back under Kickstart. You can make a donation to bring the balloon back. So what we need to do tonight, not just here tonight, but reach out to your friends and family and try to help us with this.